I am Dr. Jane Goodall, a scientist, conservationist, peacemaker, and mentor. AMA. I'm Dr. Jane Goodall. I'm a scientist and conservationist. I've spent decades studying chimpanzees and their remarkable similarities to humans. My latest project is my first ever online class, focused on animal intelligence, conservation, and how you can take action against the biggest threats facing our planet. You can learn more about my class here, www.masterclass.com jg. Follow Jane and Jane's organization the Jane Goodall Institute on social at Jane Goodall Inst and Jane on Facebook Facebook.com slash Jane Goodall. You can also learn more at www.janegoodall.org. You can also sign up to make a difference through Roots Shoots at at Roots and Shoots www.rootsandshoots.org. Proof. Link. First in 2004, when I was in the fourth grade, I did a presentation on your life and work and later mailed you photos of the presentation. You replied with the kindest handwritten note, which was one of the highlights of my early life and still hangs in my bedroom in my parents' home. A question in the past 10 or 15 years. What are the most notable steps in conservation have we taken in the right direction, and where in your opinion have we lost our way? Lastly if you ever need a personal assistant, I'm one message away. Thank you for all the work you have done. What is the secret to your health? You are still so active at what most would consider an old age. Also, thank you for all your groundbreaking work to further science and benefit humanity. I was born with good genes. That is really important when you think about health. For the rest of it, I don't really think about my health. I live each day, and I've been really lucky to be extremely healthy. My two daughters, 6'3", are huge fans of yours, and have read about you in both, The Watcher, and, Rebel Girls. They have an explorer outfit they use to pretend they are you. Matilda, 6, would like to ask you, how did you manage to get so close to the chimpanzees? How did they settle down around you? Philippa, 3, would like to ask you, do you have any pets? Here is a photo of the girls pretending to be you and a chimp, Link. Please note, response is from a member of Dr. Goodall's team, and not from Dr. Goodall herself. Hi there. First off, thank you so much for nurturing a sense of scientific curiosity within Matilda and Philippa, and for providing them with powerful female role models, including yourself, of course. For Matilda, Dr. Goodall will tell you that she was able to get close to the chimps due to her overwhelming patience and by staying very quiet. For months, they would run away in fear of her, but after a time they came to realize that she posed no danger to them. The chimpanzee, David Gray Beard was the first to become relaxed around her after exploring her campsite. For Philippa, Dr. Goodall does not have any pets of her own because she travels over 300 days a year and thinks it wouldn't be fair to an animal to leave them alone for that long. Her family has two dogs however, and she is always around animals whenever she travels, so she is never alone. Thank you for your questions. Hi Dr. Goodall. What was the pivotal point in your career where you decided that you absolutely wanted to study primates in the field? What were the reactions of your peers? Well. I first decided I wanted to go to Africa and live with animals and write books about them when I was 10 years old. And everybody laughed at me, how could I do that, Africa is so far away. In World War II we had very little money. I was simply a girl. They told me girl students cannot do that. But I had a wonderful mother who had supported my love of animals ever since I was born, and she said to me if you really want to do this, then you're going to have to work very hard and take advantage of opportunity. That's the message I take to young people all around the world today, especially to those in underserved communities. I came to study chimpanzees because of the paleontologist Louis Lakey who wanted somebody to go with him and study them he believed we shared a common ancestor six million years ago and that we could learn from their behavior what early humans might have been like. When I discovered that chimpanzees make and use tools, and that they have complex emotions and a sort of culture no one wanted to believe me. When I went to get my PhD, there was a lot of pushback. But I knew this was true so I kept going. What would you say was the biggest highlight of your career? Well, one highlight that really enabled my career to take off was discovering the chimpanzees used twigs and the brush to find termites in the underground nest because that is what went into National Geographic, which ended up providing funds for me to continue my research. So in a way, 
That was the pivotal observation that actually enabled everything else. Do you think primates should be kept in zoos? When asked about this recently, Mongabay.com. During your press conference, a reporter asked for your view of modern zoos, to which you replied that you'd rather be a chimpanzee in one of them versus how they sometimes have to live in the wild. Can you say more? Good all. It's just that I know so many places where chimpanzees must try to survive in forests that are being illegally logged, or logged by the big companies with permits. When chimpanzees try to move away, they are more than likely to encounter individuals of another community. As they are highly territorial, this means the interlopers will be attacked and such attacks often result in death. Moreover, hunters set wire snares for antelopes, pigs, etc., for food. And although the chimpanzees are strong enough to break the wire or pull a stake from the ground, the noose tightens around a hand or foot. Many individuals actually lose that hand or foot, or die of gangrene. And then there is the bushmeat trade the commercial hunting of animals for food. And the shooting of mothers to steal their infants for the illegal trade that has started up again as a result of a demand from China and other Asian countries and the UAE. Finally. As people move into the forests, they take disease with them, and chimpanzees, sharing more than 98% of our DNA, are susceptible to our contagious diseases. Now think how the best zoos today not only have much larger enclosures, but well-qualified staff who not only understand but care about the chimpanzees, as individuals, and not just species. And great effort is put into enrichment activities, both mental and physical. Counteracting boredom is of utmost importance in ensuring a well-adjusted and happy group. This, of course, applies not only to chimpanzees, but all animals with even the slightest amount of intelligence. And we are learning more and more about animal intelligence all the time. The latest buzz is the octopus. A final word. There is a mistaken belief that animals in their natural habitat are, by definition, better off. Not true, necessarily. To what extent can the vocalizations and gestures of chimpanzees be converted or translated into a language? Has progress been made translating this? There is no question that chimpanzees have a very rich way to communicate many emotions, and information about the environment. But, I don't think we can translate that into anything like human language. However, chimpanzees can actually learn human-type languages. They can learn American Sign Language, 400 or more signs, and they can also learn quite sophisticated communication systems using computers. They can learn American Sign Language, 400 or more signs, and they can also learn quite sophisticated communication systems using computers. Ah, that explains the League of Legends community. We keep destroying our environment and the beautiful creatures that share it with us. How do you keep your chin up and remain optimistic about where humanity is headed? It's tough these days, and I'd love to hear your perspective. As we look at what is happening in the world today, it is very, very grim. And because of that, a lot of people feel helpless, feel hopeless, and so they do nothing. And they fall into apathy and despair. So I have reasons for hope. I will share them quickly. One is the energy, commitment, and determination of young people and they are empowered to take action in programs like root shoots. Secondly, the human brain. We have this extraordinary weapon. We are finally beginning to use it to create clean green energy and find a new way of interacting with the environment and live in harmony with the other creatures. It's very strange, in fact the most intellectual creature to ever walk the planet is destroying its only home. And I believe there's a disconnect between a clever brain and the human heart and compassion. Only when the head and heart work in harmony can we reach our true human potential. And this, I believe, is to come. From the resilience of nature, we can help to once again support life. Animals are on the very brink of extinction and we have to give them another chance. Next there is social media, which as we all know can spew out. A lot of rubbish and misinformation. But, Used in the right way, it means that for the first time in human history, we can bring people to together around the world who all care about a particular issue like climate change so that there can be hundreds, thousands, millions, eventually billions of people all raising their voices and demanding change so that we can make a big difference and politicians will have to listen and will have to make change. And finally, the human spirit. People who tackle what seems impossible and never give up. It's so important to realize that every single one of us has that same indomitable spirit. We just have to nurture it and let it grow to make a bigger impact for good.
What was the most surprising thing you found while studying the similarities between chimpanzees and humans? I'm not sure about the most surprising, but the most shocking was the fact they are capable of war. This was very horrifying and actually made them more like humans than I thought they were before. What do you want the world to see your work for? First of all, I would like to be remembered for helping to enable people to understand that animals are like us, their intellect and they have emotions like fear as well. Because up until the mid-60s, it was actually thought that there was a difference in humans and the rest of the animal kingdom. And it was the work coming in, the early work, showing in how many ways the very biological system DNA and so forth that really changed. The other thing I hope to be remembered for is creating an environmental humanitarian program for people with root shoots, which is now in 100 countries. It involves members from preschool, kindergarten, universities, and everything in between. Its main message is every single one of us can make a difference. And make a difference every single day. Each group chooses themselves to help animals and wanting to help the environment. To educate young people to be better students, all the conservation work and other organizations to could benefit. And we've gone so far as destroying the planet, so the main hope is that the other people will grow up and do better than we've done. Thank you for doing this AMA. What would you say are the main topics in science that need to be explored deeper right now? I think there's a growing tendency to explore the intellectual ability of all kinds of different animals, and now we even know trees and plants can communicate through pheromones spreading messages in the wind or through microfungus in the roots sending messages through the ground. And because science has now opened its mind to the possibility of intelligence in creatures, we are learning so much more and it's a very exciting time. Furnit. When I flew over the national park in the early 90s and looked down, I was utterly shocked. What had been stretching to the west coast was now a tiny island surrounded by completely bare fields. People too poor to buy food from elsewhere. And struggling to survive. That is when it hit me. If we don't improve the lives of these people, there is no way we can conserve the chimpanzees. And that led to the Jane Goodall Institute program. We went not as a bunch of arrogant white people telling the villagers what to do to make their lives better, but with a hand-picked team sitting down, listening to the villagers, and asking them what they thought we could do to improve their lives. And that led to a very holistic program, which gradually grew and we could introduce new ways of helping. This paid off handsomely. The people in the villages are now our partners, helping us in conservation efforts. They've agreed to have a buffer between their villagers and the park to protect the chimpanzees. And the national park, which was completely isolated, is now gradually being linked to other groups. And this program is now in 52 villages in the Gombe area, and it's in five other countries. And it is making a huge difference. Positive in introducing the youth program reaching the villages. It's probably the most important way in which we are able to conserve chimpanzee habitats. And I'll add to that, I would say we have placed great emphasis on education, helping them stay in school beyond puberty. We do this because it's been shown all around the globe that we all improve as women's education improves. One of our problems today is a growing number of humans. As our numbers grow, there are impacts and finite resources leading to more and more poverty and hunger. What's your favorite color? My favorite color overall is green. There are times I like blue as well. I'm wearing blue today, by the way. As a scientist and researcher, how do you believe we can make a positive impact on the environment we currently live in considering the large amounts of damage already done to the earth? I think that we can only make a real difference if everybody wakes up to the fact that we have caused terrible harm to the planet, and we need to rethink the way that we live in the Western world. We've fallen into a very materialistic, money-oriented way of living, and it's placing enormous stress on the natural world. It's unsustainable, and we are told many of the non-renewable natural resources are being exploited and used up faster than Mother Nature can replenish them. So, basically we all need to think about the consequences of the life choices we make each day. What do we buy? What do we wear? What do we eat? How is it made? Is it from the environment? Is there cruelty to animals or cruelty to children? And make choices thinking not only about how is this good for me now, but also how will this affect future generations. In other words, we need to do our part in the decisions we make, in our hearts and in our heads. Hi Dr. Goodall, my four-year-old loves reading. 
She asks what is your favorite book? When I was growing up, what I read were the Dr. Doolittle books. I learned a great deal from those books. When I was 10 years old I read Tarzan. I was sad when he married the wrong Jane. It was those books that directed me to grow up, go to Africa. For a four-year-old child, one of my books I absolutely loved was Jane with illustrations by Patrick McDonnell. Which is fantastic. Another one, I want to mention is My Life with Chimpanzees which is a book I wrote for young children about my life with chimpanzees. I was sad when he married the wrong Jane. Lol I love this woman.